And um, every year, you always plan this around my ski trip, so I'm really grateful to you, Q. Um, I've been coming here for a, a long time. I'm very grateful to you, Q, for... Um, um, oh, it's not changing. Okay. Go old technology. Uh, those of you who don't know, Q is so uh, important that in Karachi, he's got his own taxi and van uh, firm that ferried us around. I'm very grateful here um, when we're in Hong Kong that um, we participated with my great mentor, William Wei, who's fourth from the left, uh, and also to visit uh, your hometown of Karachi uh, last year was a particular privilege. Um, what follows, really, is a distillation of uh, the chapter in Pediatric ENT that I wrote with Mike Rotherow. Some of you know Mike uh, from Manchester. Um, he really is a, is a great pediatric airway surgeon. And the aim uh, of this is really to make it comfortable for you. Um, uh, for, for one, so I, for the second time now, there are lots of Chinese members of the audience, so actually I don't have to tell those members what it says at the top. But essentially what it says is that the more sweat... Uh, you, the more you sweat during times of peace, the less blood you spill in times of war. Um, you know, us Chinese are very philosophical, you know. And the idea is if you practice um, how to handle a difficult airway situation and si simulation in other situations, you know, when the poop hits the fan on a Saturday night and you're on your own um, and you're dealing with a two-kilogram baby who's going blue in front of your eyes, it's actually not that difficult. As long as you know what the principles are, um, it's not that difficult. And I encourage you to uh, attend the PEST course. Um, I think you have to pay a small amount of money now to, to cover the, uh, the running cost of it, but it's largely sponsored by ENT UK. So if you're a member of ENT UK, it's a pretty trivial cost, actually. And the aims of this, really, uh, is to understand when you might want to panic and understand not how to panic. And hopefully, I'll give you some get-out-of-jail cards. It's Pediatric airway, airway emergency is something people get really stressed about. It's absolutely nothing to be stressed about. I promise you, that's what I do for a living. I'm just going to give you some top tips so that by the end of the day, if you see a blue baby tonight, you just go, no problem. Because it really isn't. The things you need to be aware is that um, things can get bad very, very quickly in, in a baby. And that's partly because their oxygen saturation, their the oxygen uh, usage is high, consumption is high, and their lung volume is low. So you don't have a lot of um, time, but you just need to know, you need to see what's happening. Um, and those of us who really deal with adults don't often think about uh, head bobbing and ala flaring, because you tend not to do that. In, if you have an adult who's struggling, in order to use accessory muscles of respiration, you grab onto the side of something and breathe like this. And, and I remember head bobbing. Um, my great teacher, Ken Pearman, who's now retired now, I remember I arrived as a as a junior registrar, and uh, times changed because I was wearing a nice grey suit with a college tie. As he said, I don't wear a college tie or any tie now. Um, I was very proud of myself, and Ken sent me to see this patient that the senior respiratory pediatrician had asked us for an opinion on. And I went there, and I was very proud. I came back. I said, yes, Mr. Perman, uh, I don't know what's the matter with the respiratory pediatrician. There seems nothing wrong with that kid. And Ken said, well, just tell me about the baby. So I talked. I said, you know, the thing is, the breathing wasn't that noisy at all, to be honest, Mr. Perman. And just to top it off, you know, the kid was really enjoying me examining him because as I was examining him, the kid just kept bobbing his head like this, almost like smiling at me. And those, those of you who know Ken Perman, he's a very gentle man. And he took his glasses off, and instead of actually whacking me with a, with a tuning fork, he said, oh, well, young man, why don't we treat this as a learning opportunity? And about 20 minutes later, we trake the baby. Um, and that, that's the sort of experience as a registrar you'd never really forget, really, uh, and, and also teaches you humility quite, uh, quite quickly. So head bobbing is not the kid smiling at you, um, and quiet is not necessarily good, because quiet normally means the baby's knackered. That's the first thing. And the second thing it means is that there isn't much airway shift. There's no much air shift through the larynx. So when a baby gets quiet and starts bobbing his head at you, uh, call an anaesthetist. Time's not on your side. And it's the, the, the problem with the pediatric airway, apart from the, the small lungs and the high oxygen consumption, is that Poiseuil, a, a great Parisian um, uh, physicist, uh, determines the law that really determines all we do about airway uh, resistance, which is that the, the resistance to flow in a lambda system is inversely proportional uh, to the fourth power of the radius. Now, what does that mean? That means actually not a lot happens. You get 50%, you know, those of you who are familiar with the Myers-Cotton grading, you think, well, actually, how come grade one is up to 50% of, of 
of stenosis. Well, clearly that's not right. It should be 25, 50. It is because actually up to about 75% of obstruction, you, uh, there isn't a lot of action. And then suddenly, once you go above that, suddenly there's an exponential rise uh, in the resistance. So actually, you need to catch the baby uh, or the small adult at the bottom, the left-hand side of that curve. And how do you interpret this uh, graphically? Well, if you think of a baby who's up to about nine months old, um, the, 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 the airway diameter is only about four millimeters. Okay? So if you have one millimeter of uh, edema, you increase the airway resistance by 16 times. Now, if you and I had even two or three millimeters of a subglottic edema, we, we, probably, we definitely wouldn't wheeze. We definitely wouldn't get strider. We might cough. I mean, if you're really unlucky, you might have a barking cough. But we could take two or three millimeters of subglottic edema with absolutely no effect. You give a baby up to nine months old two millimeters of airway edema, and they're dead. Okay, so it, it's not a lot of... Uh, as, but you need to see it coming. Once you can see it coming, it's easy. No problem at all. Um, and the, the other thing is, is where. And I think the most important thing is to have a, an idea of sound, of, of the noise. Uh, my teacher, Ken Perman, again, who amazingly is tone deaf, and that's why he never allowed us to listen to music in theatre because it just sounds like white noise to him. He said that but by far the most important thing is to listen to the sound. Because sounds are very different. Because stertor, interestingly, those who come from or train in America, so the term stertor doesn't exist in Americans. For Americans, noisy breathing is stridor, whether it's pharyngeal or laryngeal. So stertor sounds like snoring. It's almost invariably laryngopharyngeal. Stridor sounds like... And very specifically, um, people always talk about uh, the, the theoretical... The, the theory that inspiratory stridor is supraglottic, uh, expiratory stridor, like asthma and a wheeze, is infraglottic, uh, and biphasic stridor is at the cord level, so like you have in bilateral cord palsy. But in reality, babies breathe very quickly, and they all sound biphasic. Go, <laughs> and it's never quite rhythmic, okay? But there's one sound that's very characteristic, and that's of laryngomalacia, because laryngomalacia is largely a soft tissue noise, and they always have a slightly rising pitch. They go, <laughs> and they then have a little bit of a head shake at the end. I mean, you can always look at it and hear You can always look there, and... And junior pediatricians don't need you think you're really clever because you haven't got a stethoscope, you haven't got an endoscope. You go, <laughs> like that. You can say, kids got laryngomalacia. And they, they think, oh, God, that's just very clever. Well, it's not really. Because firstly, 90% of stridor in babies is laryngomalacia. So you've got a 9 out of 10 chance of getting it right, even without seeing the child. Um, but once you listen to them, heard them, it's a done deal, really. So croup is, is very common. Okay, and, I, and unfortunately, as training gets shorter and shorter, and I say this since my daughter's a, a junior doctor, uh, we get asked to look at babies with croup all the time. Okay? You know, when I started as a consultant, I almost never got asked to see a patient acutely with croup. I would recommend that you fight off all pressure to carry out a general anesthetic laryngotracheal bronchoscopy in someone with acute croup. Okay? You can always get them out of it. And if you scope them, because you always get this phone call. It's always the same. It'll be Friday evening. You'll get a very junior ED consultant uh, uh, or a new junior uh, pediatric registrar as well. This is the third episode of croup in nine months. Um, we think there's an underlying subglottic stenosis. And you're, you're, you're trying to be helpful because you're a new consultant. You say, okay, right, I'll just gas the baby down with my anesthetist and have a look. It always goes bad. Okay, so, so resist all temptation to do that. Okay. Uh, giving a, a baby a, a GA with uh, croup is a very, very uncomfortable situation. And you go there, you get a bit of bleeding when you introduce a scope. It's just not a good thing. So avoid it. Give a humidified air. Give nebulized adrenaline. Nebulized adrenaline is fantastic. Uh, give oral IV or IV dexamethasone. And intubate the patient and think about it. You've got plenty of time. Um, provided you've got decent anesthetists, uh, it's easy. Um, you can sometimes do a chest x-ray. That should have showed you a steeple sign at the top of the trachea, you don't really need it, really, because you can always hear it, have a barking cough. <coughs> Acute hepatitis I'm not going to talk about. Uh, I work at one of the most, one of the busiest children's hospitals in the world, probably, and, and I've, I've been dying to, you know, do a hot tracheostomy for acute epiglottitis. Unfortunately, I'm never going to get the opportunity. Op as I near and near, get near and near retirement, I realize that that's a bit of action I'm never going to see. Um, but I suppose nobody really wants to... <laughs> 
to, to uh, doing a, a, a crash tracheostomy in a baby. But actually, if you are unlucky and you get somebody who's got acute epiglottitis, what you need to do is you need to put a bronchoscope in position and get your assistant to just ha have a little press on the lungs. You get a little bubble of air and you drive the endoscope through it. You know, that's quite a good way of finding, the, uh, finding a way through the glottis uh, if, you, if you can't see it very clearly, it's very inflamed. Um, always bear in mind the inhaled foreign body. I, I, this is the only slide I have of inspiratory and expiratory uh, chest X-ray. The idea is if you look at the expiratory chest X-ray on the, on the uh, right of the picture, there's air trapping uh, on the left side of the photograph. I, 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 I took a, it took me a long time to find this in our, in, our, in our PAC system in the hospital because if you think about it, you've got a kid who's coughing, who's struggling, how are you going to say, take a deep breath in, hold it, I'm going to take an x-ray now, take a deep breath out, hold it. Gonna, it's just, it's not possible, okay? But those of you who are sitting the exam, the answer is, what imaging would you use for a suspected uh, foreign body? Um, the correct answer is, don't be bloody stupid. I'm just going to take the baby to uh, the theater to look. That, of course, will fail the exam, will save the baby. Uh, the answer would pass the exam but kill the baby is I would take the baby down to a dark quiet x-ray department and take inspiratory and expiratory films okay so the correct answer for those of you who are consultants and those who you take part three quite different uh, and the most of the examiners of part three I know there are some here probably never seen an inhaled foreign body before in a child um, the other question you get in the exam for those of you seeing exam is what what do you what clinical examination do you do for um, uh, airway distress okay the classical correct exam answer is I would uh, make the baby very comfortable. I'd carry out a fiber optic uh, examination. It depends where you are, okay? If you're not in a place with acute uh, pediatric resuscitation skills and you've got a baby who is, does, doesn't have just simple laryngomalacia, if you do a flexible scope, you can actually pre precipitate uh, laryngospasm and kill the child, okay? So if you're in some peripheral hospital somewhere and uh, a, a, a GP sent you a, a stridulous baby. Don't l reach over for the four millimeter endoscope and just thought, think, yeah, I'm going to drive it through. Because you are much more likely to cause harm than to cause good. And actually, in reality, wh what are you going to see? What are you going to see? You're, you're not going to see anything. You know, the, art, the theory is you might see a, a large molecular cyst or something. That is so rare. You're, you're going to put this in, you're going to see laryngomalacia. Oh, very good. You knew it was laryngomalacia anyway. Let's say you see unilateral cord palsy. Well, so what? If you see bilateral cord palsy, you'd be very lucky because it's quite difficult to see bilateral cord palsy um, without recording. But actually, you should know it's, it sounds like bilateral cord palsy sounds like bilateral cord palsy. And actually, if you've got bilateral cord palsy, you accidentally touch the, the arotenoids. That might be the end of that. Uh, so d d don't do that sort of thing. Uh, but those of you sitting exam, when you ask this question, yes, I'd like to do an awake fiber optic because it's a dynamic examination allows me to see that there's no supraglottic pathology. And then you probably get a gold medal, okay? So, but if you're, on, if you're not in the exam, maybe not. <laughs> because there are lots of things to help you out, okay? In, in, in any hospital, and there's loads of things to help you out. You know, and it's made uh, airway examination so much easier. Sevaflurane is a very non-irritant anesthetic gas. Um, as long as you've got an anesthetist, the most important thing in, in an airway situation, acute airway situation, is a good anesthetist. If you haven't got a good anesthetist, you're in, down to a bad thing. Luckily, most anesthetists who aren't regular pediatric airway anesthetists are pretty scared. So if you get somebody, they're likely to ring a friend in the middle of the night who deals with this thing more. But the things you need, you want to decongest the nose before you put a nasopharyngeal airway in. It seems a simple thing, actually. But actually, all you need in a critical situation uh, is a little bit extra. I like cycling, and people have asked Team Sky, why are you so successful? They said, well, it's because we have marginal gains. We, our wheels are a bit better, you know, our frames are a bit better, our, our diet's a bit better. What you don't want in a critical airway situation, the, the anesthetist says, oh, I was GOS for an update course, and they say put an azopharyngeal airway in. You put an azopharyngeal airway in before just decongesting the nose, and suddenly, bang, there's blood. You know, a stridulous baby with blood in the pharynx. So you don't want that. So take your time, think about it. Otravine, grease up the endotracheal tube for the nasopharyngeal airway. It doesn't need to be a very big one. And make sure you spray the, spray the cords. Um, those of you who've uh, done any of this will know that if you spray the, uh, use something like xylocaine spray that you get out of a bottle, 
the benzalkonium uh, in it is quite easily in the baby precipitate laryngospasm. So if, you could, uh, if it's at all possible, get plain <coughs> lignocaine. And the thing to do is to make sure you ask the anesthetist how much lignocaine can you use because there's a limited amount of lignocaine you can give to a two kilogram baby. So the anesthetist will be able to work it out, draw it up, and you can either use a mucosal atomizing device or, or if you don't have that, just get a Venflon and just, just squirt it in. And that gives you very good uh, laryngeal anesthesia without uh, the preservative causing uh, any problems. And the most important thing is to have a team that you have working with you who know what they're doing. Um, and most of all, the anesthetist. So this is briefly how you do a, a, an acute or, or an elective airway um, uh, intubation. So here's your anesthetist with a mucosal atomizing device. She's already preloaded the maximum amount of lignocaine you can use. Um, you can use that as long as you drill dry it up. You know that for the rest of the operation, if you use that amount of lignocaine, you're not going to send the kid into some cardiac event. And then um, you put a Goodell airway in. You've got plenty of time. And then take um, the Goodell airway out, and you put a uh, an endotracheal tube in. It, it, dep it depends how you do it. Um, but, uh, Monica Stokes did this. She likes you to cut the, the endotracheal oh. tube so that you know she knows she's already measured the length, so that the tip of the tube is just coming just south of the free edge of the soft palate. So you know it's not it's working and it's not touching the epiglottis. Okay. Now you don't need to have anything fancy. Now it's, uh, not all hospital uh, departments will have a bronchoscope. But everybody who does private practice has a 2.8 millimeter, 2.7 millimeter Hopkins rod. Okay, and if you take the cap off an endotracheal tube, it needs to be at least a 3.5 endotracheal tube or bigger. You can just thread the through it, and you've got your own bronchoscope. Um, you you may snap your bronchoscope, but thousand quid is well spent if you can uh, not go to jail uh, for having a baby go blue in front of you. So uh, this is a courtesy of Mike Rothera showing that actually is very, very straightforward. This is, there's some artistic license in this. If you look, here's a child who's got uh, a bit of micronathia. You can't see very well down the side. But if you have an endoscope and you pull the endoscope right laterally into the far lateral position, you stick your tube in, it's really easy. Now, this was useful in the, in the, back in the day, but actually you probably don't even need to do that now because most EDs which have take pediatric admissions will have a glide scope uh, or an equivalent. The glide scope is incredibly easy to use. Uh, so um, the first thing you want to ask for before you get your, um, uh, your Hopkins rod out of your bag is have you got a glide scope? Okay, the only slight trouble with glide scopes is that even the smallest um, in intubating, it doesn't work great um, for a, a baby much more than two and a half, three kilograms. Uh, <laughs> you should be pretty worried anyway if you've got a blue baby that's two and a half kilograms. But, but of course, the gold standard is the ventilating bronchoscope um, of various sizes. Um, and uh, this is a video that I made uh, for our own kit. I used to just email this to people to ask for it. But actually, I'm thinking about it now, it's best not to use my video because everyone will buy different sorts of kit. You can talk to the rep outside. You don't need every size. You just need a few sizes. And the thing to do is to put it together with your nurse. And now with iPhones, it's so easy. Just take a video so that actually if, if, if you're on, an, on call on a night with a non-airway scrub team, they just need to watch the video that's on the theater desktop and just put it together. And it's extremely easy. It should, that, that's probably 15 minutes well spent when you've got a, a patient who's canceled. Um, and then once you've got that in position, it's really pretty straightforward. Um, Thank you. You just uh, put that in. And if you don't have a pathoscope, the, the, the intubated laryngoscope also works extremely well. And then you just plug this in. And you've got all the time in the world. You can do whatever you like. Once you've got a bronchoscope in the, uh, in the larynx, um, if you look at the screen at the top, once you've got a bronchoscope in the larynx, you can ventilate through it. If, if, it's, if it's dodgy, you can put a, a bougie through it and, and, and intubate through the bougie. But it, it never is a problem, really. Um, so it's pretty easy, really. It's a pretty straightforward situation. And of course, the aim of all this is uh, not to do a tracheostomy, um, because um, I, I, doing, a, doing a hot trachea on a baby is really not something you want to do um, when you should be watching Strictly Come Dancing or something, because it's a very bad thing to do at hot tracking. 
Um, so there are some situations you need to be aware of in babies. So, for example, this is a pedunculated respiratory papillomatosis. I don't know. I think by the time the effect of Gardasil has come in, I'll have retired as an airway surgeon. But you get a few of these every year. And as long as you've got an anesthetist calm, and when they, when they put the child to sleep and look, they see that, they don't go, Bleh! it's easy. You, know, you just need to make sure. And that's where the team brief is really useful. You tell them, what, what do you think are the possibilities? And your anesthetist shouldn't be worried at all, because that's really easy. Because once the patient's relaxed, that bobbing in and out is not a huge problem. You put them into theater. You put them into suspension, just like you, you would with an adult. You're assessing for laryngeal cancer. Just go to suck it out, take it out, just cut it off. Adrenaline neuropathy, easy peasy, okay? Um, you very often now see uh, small cysts. They're very easy to deal with. If you can, if, the, if your anesthetist can maintain uh, airway um, control with spontaneous respiration, you can always take these up with cut, cup forceps, pretty straightforward, straight into, the, uh, uh, into um, suspension. If not, just intubate it and send it on to your local friendly ENT airway surgeon. Um, every now and then, you get something that you really look down and you think, oh, God, this is a really bad day. Um, and if you look at this girl, this is Rhiannon, she got quieter and quieter and quieter. And amazingly, because it got more and more stenosed over about a few weeks, she was coping extremely well, except she was getting quieter and quieter. I, remi I remember this as if it was yesterday, because the registrar thing, yeah, you don't need to come in, actually, because she's getting quieter. Um, that's always a bad thing. Um, so if you look at this, so it's just, just to show you that actually with modern skills, which you all have, everybody in here does fez. There's, this is just like fez with longer instruments, really, um, <laughs> except you have to have a really ballsy anesthetist because you're saying to anesthetist, just, vent, just allow the child to breathe normally through this, keep it asleep and don't let it move. Okay, I mean, it's easy. I mean, <laughs> you, know, you say that to anesthetist, they just look at you and laugh. But actually, from a surgeon's point of view, it's easy peasy. It's a tickle knife. You use that in the fez all the time. Um, you have a rigid endoscope. You use that all the time. And then you just take a balloon. You know, any, any, you, you can use an airway balloon if you like, or uh, you can use a, a valvotomy balloon. Um, I, I happen to use valvotomy balloons because I'm tight. Um, uh, valvotomy because we just steal them from the cardiac surgeons and they don't notice. Um, the problem with valvotomy balloons, they're compliant. Okay, so nasal sinus balloons and airway balloons are non-compliant. So, um, so these have got a bit of a wasting in them, but they cost 120 quid as opposed to 1,000, so that's fine. Yeah. And then if you've got time, you find that in a situation like this, you just inject a bit of triamcinolone. Um, you can either, depending on how big the baby is, you're going to use a big venflon, a spinal needle, or a deflux needle, uh, which you probably would have if you worked in a, a, a hospital with a urologist because they in inject the bladder neck with this deflux needle. And then you see that actually very quickly, this is probably a 10-minute procedure, you've got the situation from being near critical to pretty good, actually. Of course, then that's when you take your gloves off and have a cigarette, um, which is fine, but don't have too many cigarettes because you, it, you want to bring that child back um, within probably a week or two because this will tend to stenose quite quickly and just balloon again. And see, so you, can, you work out your uh, interdilatation uh, interval uh, because that varies from patient to patient. Sometimes you see things which are really, you just give you, give you uh, the need for taking Gaviscon advance. You know, I, no one's giving me a, you know, a tip from outside, but this is the sort of thing you see that you reach for the Gaviscon advance immediately. But actually, you knew it was coming anyway, because here's the Oscar. She's, he's got a huge parotid hemangioma. I mean, you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to work out that that's a parotid hemangioma. And there's a pretty good chance if he's stridulous like crazy that he's got a subglottic hemangioma as well. And there is a subglottic hemangioma. You know, and you look at that and you think, this is a, a bad day at the office. But it's not really. It's a soft. You know, if you really can't cope with it, just stick an endotracheal tube in and think about it. Come back tomorrow. You can always come back to fight another day. And this is what you do. You give them some oral... Uh, prednisolone, you, you reduce the prednisolone and you increase the propranolol uh, and that's what it looks like three months later. Easy peasy. That's the ultimate in um, uh, minimally invasive surgery. That's no invasive surgery at all. So there are some core messages here. In the acute situation, 
you should be aware that things can get bad very quickly. But as long as you're anticipating it, it's not a problem. And the reason they get qu bad quickly is because they have a small airway, they have a high oxygen <coughs> consumption and small lungs, okay? Examine the child quickly but calmly uh, and establish differential diagnosis. There's absolutely no need to stick a stethoscope anywhere near a child with a breathing, noisy breathing, okay? First, it's cold, it makes a, the child cry, and it's just terrible, okay? Recruit help early. Um, those of you who are juniors, uh, sharing the blame is one of the great things nobody teaches you as a junior. Always share the blame. Get a respiratory pediatrician. Get a, an anaesthetist. The anaesthetist, I can guarantee you, will get two other anaesthetists, okay? I work at a huge children's hospital with 32 consultant anaesthetists, okay? If, you get, if you're on call with an anaesthetist who's not a regular airway anaesthetist, I can guarantee you that he will get in another two consultant anaesthetists. Because, and these are people who are regular pediatric anaesthetists. So share the blame. If you're on call, you know, get your WhatsApp group of your other consultants and say, mate, I got a two and a half kilogram baby who's going blue. I can guarantee, well, if and not at least one of your mates, colleagues comes and join you, then you should move to another hospital. Um, <laughs> but they should come in to help you. There's, it's no, there's no advantage of fighting this on your own. You, an extra pair of hands is helpful if sometimes the suspension doesn't work, you know, someone, you get a consultant colleague do, being your suspension. All this sort of thing helps. So recruit help. I can't, that's probably the most important line here. Recruit help early and deploy resuscitation maneuvers because suddenly you give adrenaline. You can't give too much nebulized adrenaline, okay? People always think, it's like when they have registrars to come who never, who never uh, treated children before, they always try and uh, volume resuscitate an eight-year-old with systolic pressure of 80 or 90. An eight-year-old has a systolic pressure of 80 or 90. They're not hypotensive. So you don't need to give an eight-year-old eight gelafusin, you know, when you... So, you know, you can't give too much nebulized adrenaline. It just, it'll just blow out, okay? So just squirt a whole load of um, uh, adrenaline, one in a thousand adrenaline into a nebulizer, nebulizer in the air, and the patient gets better so quickly. It's, it's incredible. They get better regardless of the, if it's laryngomalacia, they get better. If it's uh, a croup, they get better. It doesn't matter. Just give dexamethasone and nebulized adrenaline. It buys you at least 15 minutes, okay? And 15 minutes, believe me, is, a, is like a lifetime for, for you, and it's easy. Now, I put heliox there because a lot of people have heliox. I don't like heliox. The idea that heliox reduces the rheological characteristics of the air, I, I never use it. Um, but if you have heliox in your hospital, please go ahead and use it. Uh, and finally, the question is, should you have a source of ventilating a bronchoscope? Um, uh, for the 90% of the audience who probably don't read Chinese, it says you feed an army for a 1,000 days just to deploy it for one hour. It's a very expensive piece of equipment. You know, it's probably even the basic skeleton set is probably 15 grand, 10, 15 grand. So would you have 10, 15 grand's worth of kit standing there when you're, un you're likely to use it probably in anger once in your career? Boy, when you need it, you really want it. So I'm not, I, I don't have any disclosures. I'm not, uh, I'm not sponsored by Storts in any way, uh, but I think you should, should seriously think about having this and having a planned uh, and trained team. Um, again, I emphasize that this is available for consultants who are members of ENT UK. That just leaves me to thank my patients for teaching me uh, what I know. Thank you. I'm happy to take some questions on airway emergencies while I set up for the next talk. Any questions? It's easy, isn't it? Really, it's just, you know, as long as you know what's coming. <laughs> as long as you know what, what beast is coming around the corner, it's really easy. You know? Okay, this is also very practical. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about neck lumps in children. I think I've got about 12, 15 mi minutes to do it in. Uh, I'd be very grateful if you didn't take photos of these because <laughs> unlike the airway photos where you can't see the owner of the larynx, you can see the owner of these lumps, and, and they're a little bit, um, a bit icky, really. So I prefer if I'd be really grateful. I can't emphasize enough if you don't take photographs of these slides. Well, text slides, do what you like, but... So this is what we're hoping to talk about, talk about cervical lymphadenopathy, about non-tubercular cervical lymphadenopathy, and some other little uh, rare things. Um, the only systematic review of how to manage uh, cervical lymphadenopathy in children came uh, in an expert review of anti-infective therapy. 
and it's, a, it's from a group in Italy, and it tells you about Italians, because this paper's got about 10 billion authors in it. They'll probably all go, hey! But, and, and, and very typically Italian, you know, they probably can't say anything but one word when 23 will do. And look, this is the, this is the Al flow chart. I mean, can you imagine this? I mean, who, who actually understands any of this, OK? Um, so um, what you really want is guidance. And the guidance you want is from an Iraqi Scotsman. Uh, and this is Haytham Kubba, of those of you who know. Uh, he is a Scottish Iraqi or an Iraqi Scotsman, whichever you want to look at it. And he's a top bloke. He's intelligent. Um, and he's sensible, and this is what he worked out. Now, the important thing about pediatric cervical impalpability is that everybody has it, okay? If you go down to central Doncaster and grab a whole load of five-year-olds and felt their necks, you'll probably get arrested, but actually, you'll probably find that almost all of them will have little lymph nodes bobbing around the neck. It's just, and, and almost certainly none of them have lymphoma, Okay. Because it's completely different than in adults. You know, in an adult, you have a lymph node palpable in the neck, you've got cancer until proven otherwise. It's not the same in children. Everybody has it, okay? And it depends what you can do about the biopsy, you see. Uh, I come from Hong Kong. Us Chinese, we're really dead hard, okay? And you can probably do a fine needle aspiration biopsy in a, in a, in a six-year-old child in, in, uh, of my extraction. I don't know about Donny. Maybe you're really hardcore here. But in Birmingham, my goodness. You need to be like 32 before you let somebody stick a needle in your neck. So, so it, you know, you have to decide at what point you're going to take a tissue diagnosis because it's not just like wrapping a kid in a blanket and just stabbing them with a green needle or a blue needle because they're just not going to let you do it uh, in Birmingham. So you, you've got to be careful. You're going to have to put them to sleep. So what, what we need to do is, what, which lymph nodes need to come out? Well, nodes greater than two centimeters should be excised. And that, by two centimeters, I mean two centimeters in the short axis on ultrasound scanning, OK? It's easy. So the, the things I want to uh, emphasize here is that if you send a child for an ultrasound scan report, if they don't give you specific information, send them back, because it means the radiologist doesn't know what they're talking about, OK? Superclavicular nodes are almost always bad, OK? I'll just tell you. If you've got a superclavicular node, you've got to take one out, OK? Nodes in children with history of malignancy, you know, that seems obvious, should be taken out. Duration of history is not particularly useful, actually. You, that's probably quite logical, because if you've had it for ages and you're still not dead from your lymphoma, you probably haven't got lymphoma. These other symptoms are helpful, but, you know, not absolutely definite, nothing in like this. But the most important is to get an ultrasound. And you want to know whether it's got an inhomogeneous echo texture, blurred margins, whether the lymph nodes are round, what the vascular pattern is, uh, and whether they've got an abnormal hilum. If your, if your radiology re ultrasound report comes back, the glibly says, looks like reactive lymph nodes. You know, unless you know the radiologist personally, send it back, because it's rubbish, because they don't know what you're looking for. If it comes back and says, it has a homogeneous echo texture, the margins are sharp, uh, the, 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 the lymph nodes are all ovoid in shape uh, with a normal vascular pattern and a normal hilum, then you can pretty much look at the pa parents in the eye and say, your child does have lymphoma, bye-bye. I don't need to see you again. Okay. Chest x-ray may be helpful, easy, cheap examination to do. Full count can be helpful, can, may not. Serology is sometimes helpful. Um, the thing is, actually, realistically, in a child, an FNA is not really sufficiently sensitive if you're thinking of reticular endothelial pathology. Uh, FNA is very specific. The unsatisfactory rate is high. So you can, if you have a good IR person, uh, they'll do an ultrasound-guided call for you. Uh, if not, you can take it out yourself. And just, to rem just remember, go back, to the day, go back to the days when you were SHOs. You know, lymph node biopsy is something that you throw to the SHO like a little present at the end of the day while you go and... Uh, uh, have a cigarette. Um, firstly, you shouldn't be having cigarettes anymore, and, and you shouldn't be throwing lymph node biopsies uh, to the SHO because no SHO learns where the accessory nerve is until they've removed it, um, <laughs> doing a lymph node biopsy. Okay. So this is a good algorithm. It's quite easy. And you, you guys will see this all the time. Everybody sees it all the time, whether you're in a teaching hospital, you're in a children's hospital, adult hospital, you, you see this all the time, okay? If there's a history of malignancy, the node's bigger than two centimeters, or it's a supracavicular fossa, take it out. Otherwise, do a chest x-ray. If the chest x-ray is abnormal, take it out. Just to remind you, okay, is that 
it, the X-ray is very important anyway, because if you really suspect lymphoma and the child's got lympha mediastinal widening and mediastinal lympha lymphoma, it is quite possible that when you give the general anesthetic and, uh, and, and paralyze the intubation, the child will die. Okay, so a ch chest X-ray is pretty useful for that anyway. And if your, if your anesthetist knows what they're doing, what they're doing, the first thing they'll ask you, if you say, you know, what, what are you doing the lymph, lymph node biopsy for? You say, well, I think there might be lymphoma. The first thing you should ask you is, is there a chest X-ray? Is the mediastinal shadow normal? If he doesn't ask you that, then you say, get me another anesthetist. <laughs> um, but if you have mediastinal widening, you've got a mediastinal lymphoma, it's a very bad thing to give them a tumor yeah. and paralyze them. Okay. Otherwise, give uh, bloods, do an ultrasound, give antibiotics, to see them two weeks later. And if two weeks later, if any of those tests are abnormal, take it out. Um, if uh, the serology is positive or the lump is uh, getting smaller, it's discharge, if not, take it out. That's a pretty easy thing. And uh, uh, Haytham has published this in clinical otolaryngology. It's much more of a difficult decision what you do about non tuberculous uh, mycobacterial cervical lymphadenopathy. It's, quite, it's not uncommon, and you often get this as a cold lymphadenopathy. You have a bluish tinge over the skin. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis. The first thing you mustn't do is let the pediatricians get hold of them, because if you do, they'll do a MONTU test. The MONTU test will be equivocal. Then they'll do another MONTU test. It'll be equivocal. They'll do a MONTU test with a higher dose. It'll be PPD. It'll be <coughs> equivocal. And then they're going to wait. They're going to do an early morning gastric um, lavage. That's going to be equivocal. By which time you've got, gone from a nice little excisable discrete thing to a thing that's going bleh, like that. Okay? And that's bad. However, if you go by clinical diagnosis, you do sometimes get it wrong. So this is a pilomatrix soma. It's okay. If it's wrong, it needs to come out anyway, the pilomatrix soma. So what? So, but if you're not careful, you let pediatricians go on and on. This is what you end up with, and it's all over the place. It's disgusting. Um, and your surgery is much more difficult because the skin is icky. Good technical term, icky. But you know what I mean. It's icky. <laughs> so what do you do? You can treat them with medical treatment. You can treat them with surgical treatment. And, and the, the, the treatment debate rages on. Okay, And it's partly how comfortable you are operating around that area, how how the disease is, ex uh, is, is uh, uh, ex extending, uh, and also what its relation is to critical nerves, which are aesthetic nerves and so on. Um, there's a strong argument is why do you do an operation for an infection? Well, I suppose we do that for tonsillectomy all the time. Um, but why would you do an operation for infection? That, that's a good case for not doing it. But the, the, the general consensus, actually, is probably if you catch it at a good time, and it's not right sitting right over the marginal mandibular nerve. If you take it out, uh, you, can, you, can, you can get control quite quickly with minimal skin change. Okay? Uh, if you're going to do the operation, use a nerve monitor, uh, make your incision a clear, healthy skin. If you try and it, most of the time, the skin involved is quite wide area. And if you try and get a closure, it it's all, always ends up in tears. You can leave the affected skin almost as a split skin thickness skin graft. Uh, make your skin incision well away from it. And if you're going to do an operation, do a proper operation. Just don't go poking around and scooping out a lymph node or two. If you're going to you know, either don't do an operation, which is entirely reasonable, or you do an operation and you do it properly. Um, I suppose this is an extremely common uh, question in the part three exam because everyone's got a photo of it. Um, work out what your answer is going to be. Um, just be sensible. <laughs> If you have a late sinus discharge, it is always, always, always associated with a, a lymph node. Okay, so if you see a late sinus discharge, there's a great temptation to just go in and take an ellipse of skin and take it out. Inevitably, it'll come back. And you, if you do, if you see there's a, a sinus is discharging, it's always, as you can see here, related to the deeper lymph node. If you take the lymph, deeper lymph node out, that'll be that. Okay. Um, the British Thoracic Society recommends you give anti- uh, mycobacterial chemotherapy for at least six months. Um, uh, a lot of people don't. Um, I do. I, and I, that's probably because I'm slightly um, uh, biased by the fact that this is a child, a five-year-old child who came in who had a lymph node taken out by our pediatric uh, uh, surgical colleagues and never gave them any more clarithromycin and ephambitol, uh, and they came in with a 20 mil pus in the parapangeal space. That was really distinctly unpleasant um, experience because they couldn't really lie down to do a CT scan. So the case against surgery is that a discharging science dries up after cup crystal, a crook of the smile is for life. You don't want that. So this is my friend, um, uh, Zach, who came to me. Oh, the video is not going to 
Hopefully, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to talk about some of the other things, some of the, for example, with antenatal management. Um, you, you should anticipate um, congenital high airway obstruction. Uh, this being American, they call it chaos. Uh, you don't want it to be chaotic. Um, uh, it being, providing an exit service is a good thing. It's, it's easy. Um, you, it's a nice day out. You see some obstetricians, and you have a cup of tea, and you sit there, and you see a nice, happy family, and you deliver the baby. The idea is you deliver the head and the shoulders and the neck, uh, and you should, provided your, your obstetrician is on board with you and doesn't spill three liters of amniotic fluid, which they always do, um, uh, you should be able to maintain fetal maternal blood flow for about half an hour, uh, during which time you can um, get your anesthetist to intubate, uh, or you can do a bronchoscopy. But of course, sometimes you have a situation like this is really anxious, anxiety provoking. Uh, so I was really, really happy that when this happened, I was in Hawaii. Um, <laughs> But my co I, I remember that because my, my, my colleague rang me and said, what are you doing in Hawaii? I said, well, I don't know, just having a nice time. And he said, well, I'm going to send you a picture on WhatsApp um, of the fetal ultrasound. Um, and he said, what am I going to do about it? I said, well, I don't know, get a bronchoscope and have a really ballsy pediatric anesthetist and tell the obstetrician, why didn't you warn us about this earlier and have, a, have an elective cesarean section? To be fair, this baby was born at uh, 24 weeks. Uh, the mother was HIV positive um, and uh, went to unexpected premature labor. Um, so he just put a, found the hole with a bronchoscope. That's why the bronchoscope is so useful. You know, that's a sort of one hour you use your bronchoscope and you've got, got it in the shelf. When you fed your army for a thousand days, this the hour when you think, whoa, that, well, that was worth feeding for a thousand days. But once you've got control of the airway, again, it's really easy. I mean, it's, the operation was embarrassingly easy. I, I didn't put the photo in, it was a bit gory. You just do a tracheostomy, take it out. It's really not that difficult. Um, congenital neck masses, sometimes they come out and you're not expecting them. Um, there is no rush. There is absolutely no rush. So if you don't want to deal with it, transfer it to your major pediatric center. Otherwise, look at some biochemical markers, do an echo. You must be very careful when you've got big masses in the child that you may go into hyperdynamic heart failure because a significant amount of the of the, uh, of the blood circulation is in is, is in the lump um, if you have to do a prostatectomy um, which can occur either with a persistent first branchial arch anomaly uh, or with uh, sometimes you get lipoblastomas or pleomorphic adenomas in very small babies um, just remember that the the facial nerve is unbelievably superficial, unbelievably superficial. So you, you open it, you may, you, know, you, you may have done like 100 <coughs> superficial prostatectomies in, in, in adults. You open the neck and you see something that is in the correct right direction for a facial nerve. And you think, I, I remember doing this myself, you know, and, and I'd done probably a dozen uh, prostatectomies on babies. I said to my registrar, I said that, you know, you, know, you must remember the the facial nerve is really superficial, but not as superficial as this. I'll just show you. And I just touched it, and it just went like that. You know? And the, 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 it's almost just subcutaneous. Okay? So if you think anything looks like the facial nerve, it probably is. Depth is not a good, good, uh, good savior for you. If you do thyroglossal duct cyst excision, just remind you, do a wide dissection. And if you are, because an ultrasound scan is supposed to tell you whether uh, it's something's a dermoid or thyroglossal duct cyst. It doesn't do anything of the sort. All, a all, all an ultrasound can tell you is whether something is related to the hyoid bone. And also, the, for those seeking the exam, um, you always ask, if you have a midline, what's the exam issue? Well, you open the mouth, you hit your tongue out. And if, it, the, the, if, the, if the lump moves up with sticking your tongue out, it's a thyroglossal duct cyst. Okay? It's absolute rubbish. I've actually, I've actually spoken to examiners. They really believe this, okay? It doesn't matter. All it means when you're, a lump in the midline moves up <coughs> is that it's stuck to the hyoid. If it's a dermoid and it's stuck to the hyoid, it moves. If it's a thyroglossal duct cyst, it moves. If it's a lymph node stuck to the hyoid, it moves, okay? So moving with extrusion of tongue has absolutely no clinical value whatsoever. So sometimes you, do, you plan a cyst trunk procedure. You go in there and you, you look at it and it's clearly a, an epidermoid cyst, okay? There's no need to remove the hyoid bone because embryologically it has no reason to remove the hyoid bone, okay? 
Uh, the case of the fourth branchial arch challenge is a nice one because you'll get this every now and then, especially if you're an adult head and neck surgeon, you'll get a, a phone call um, about a, a fourth, about someone with a suppurative lump in the left side of the neck. It's for some reason, 16 out of 17 cases are on the left side of the neck, okay? And we probably get about one or two a year at the children's hospital. And, and it will come from an oncologist or a pediatrician, and you always have a, a, a pair of screaming, inconsolable parents because they've been told they have thyroid cancer, okay? You look at them, and then you say, don't worry, uh, I'm going to do a bear and swallow. And they look at you and say, what, what, you mean, like, my mother had a pharyngeal pouch and he had, she had a bear and so on. I said, yeah, just like one of those. And they think you're completely crazy. And you say, look, would you just stop crying? Okay, just, just stop crying. You're going to have a bear and swallow, it's all going to be fine. And it is, because actually that's all it is. You, you see, you see the ultrasound like this, and it always comes back speckled calcification consistent with papillary carcinoma. Um, and you look, MRI scan, inhomogeneous in uh, MR texture consistent with um, papillary thyroid cancer. And you do a contrast swallow, you see a little track that goes from the piriform fossas at the front of the neck. Uh, sorry, these don't project very well. And you do a laryngoscopy, <coughs> and you see here that's the left piriform fossa, and there's a hole in the piriform fossa. You look at it, you grab it, you stick a bovi, uh, a, a, a bug bee needle, a monopolar diathermy needle, or if you have a KTP laser, that also works. And you can put a stitch through it if you like. Um, if you just want to show the registrar that you can deliver a ATO suture uh, and, and tie a knot. And that's the end of that, you know, cured, okay? And they think you're very clever. So that's, that's my favorite diagnosis of the year. Um, lymphatic malformations and vascular malformations, also you don't need to worry about them. But remember, it could be the tip of the iceberg. Make sure it's not going into the axilla or into the, into the thorax, as this is the case would be. You've got time. You've got time. Everyone gets really excited and very anxious because the parents get anxious. You've got loads of time. So the first thing you tell the parents, you haven't, your child doesn't have cancer. We've got time, we'll work it out. I, my priority is to make sure the breathing is okay. And then just do an operation if it's convenient. If it's not, if you have the facilities to in, intervene inter, interventional radiology, it all depends. There's no correct answer. So those of you sitting the exam, what is the management of this patient? The management is to reassure the parents Make sure that the airway is secure and the lymphatic malformation is not an air, in an area where sudden bleed will, uh, will compromise the airway. And I'll in, investigate by cross-sectional imaging in good time and then uh, make an MDT decision based on availability of interventional radiology. So anybody who gives that answer gets the gold medal. I expect a, a box of chocolates to go with that. Okay. Uh, so... Just to summarize, I hope this is what we've uh, covered in uh, the neck. I hope that's been uh, of entertainment to you. And again, I thank my, parents and my patients for their education. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. No, clear as mud. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, good morning, all. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you, Q, for asking me to come and give this talk on pediatric syndromes. It's one of those talks that can be quite challenging. Uh, there's a lot of syndromes out there. There's about 3,000 syndromes and more around. So how many of these do we need to know? I come across in my pediatric practice many syndromes, some of which I've never heard. Now, I'll have a child referred by a pediatric uh, colleague of ours, and I say, oh, my God, all right. The good thing is that there's a computer in the room, and you've got the letter in front of you, and you've got a diagnosis, and you go on to Google. That's your friend in clinics when you've got challenging uh, diagnoses that you've got to deal with. So in a lot of cases where you've got 
a patient, probably you've got about three patients in the whole of UK, for example, of that syndrome. You're not going to know about it. Patients themselves are quite expert. They're all on Facebook with their own groups. They've got these, you know, you'll have a cleft group, you'll have a, a group on Down syndrome, which are very common, but you also have it for all the very non-common syndromes because they want to get in touch with the people who have experience of this. So I, what my job here today is to help you succinctly identify certain syndromes that we commonly see in ENT um, and how you deal with them. You might not be able to completely uh, sort their uh, disease process out, but there are things that as an ENT surgeon that you will be expected to provide. A syndrome is a Greek word, and it means running together, where a number of anomalies come together as a, as a result of a single cause. Where a sequence, where you have in uh, Pierre Robin's sequence, for example, is you have multiple anomalies caused by one single malformation, and it's a result, and it, that, malform, that single anomaly leads to a sequence of uh, events that leads to a number of anomalies. Whereas in the past, I think if you remember, when I was a registrar, it was just changing charge, became a syndrome, it used to be an association, and at that stage, uh, charge was not known to have a uh, genetic cause, but we do now. Uh, but an association is where there's a non-random amount of multiple anomalies that come along, and we haven't yet found a cause yet. So I've tried to group syndromes a little bit, and it's nice to kind of provide a structure in our minds about how we can put them into groups because it makes this easier to kind of identify with them. So we've got the genetic syndromes, with chromos we've got the chromosomal ones like trisomic 21, Turner's, etc. But then we've got the craniofacial ones, which are craniosynostosis, the connective tissue ones with the mucopolysacrodosis, the marfans, the elodendros. We've got the branchial arch ones, which are the golden house, obesity. We've got uh, the Prada willy and others, which you can read on the slide. So we've gone from the first one. Trisomy 21 is probably the commonest syndrome you're going to see in your ENT clinic. They come along with increased maternal age, and they're higher in, 20, in the 45-year-olds compared to the 20-year-olds. And there's a number of steps that the, the obstetricians and the midwives will subject you to if you are having a baby, if you're a female. Um, and it depends on the age of... Uh, or the, to the age of the pregnancy. So the combined test, where it's a simple blood test, you do it at about 10 to 14 weeks. If you've missed the boat on that, you go to a quadruple test, and that's up to 20 weeks. But the diagnosis is made by a choriovillus uh, sampling or amniocentesis, which has a 1% chance of spontaneous uh, abortion. These children come with features of ge uh, a general feature and an ENT uh, feature that we are more interested in. But always remember that these children come with a typical facial feature with the epicanthal folds <coughs> kind of obliquely parallel and downfolding. And you've got the cardiac anomaly. So always wonder whether a child with uh, trisomy 21 has a cardiac anomaly. Not all of them will have it, but a lot of them do. They have intellectual disability, and this is variable depending on the degree of trisomy 21 that they've got affecting them, low immunity, and these are quite hyper-flexible hyper children. But for ENT, what do you see? I see them coming through my clinic by a pediatrician telling me, oh, they've got obstructive sleep apnea. So I've got to take their tonsils and adenoids out. They've got macroglossia. A lot of the time you don't do anything about the macroglossia, it does improve but you do take their tonsils and that noise out, and the marginal airway is improved. They will have hearing loss. A lot of Down syndrome children will have a hearing aid on. Uh, then ears are quite narrow, the ear canals, so putting in a grommet 
isn't necessarily the right thing to go ahead and do because you probably don't get anything bigger than a mini shine at most times, and that falls out pretty quickly. So it's just subjecting them to unnecessary GA if you can help it. A hearing aid is good, as per the NICE guidelines. <clears throat> Subglottic stenosis, so these children, if they've got cardiac issues, they've had cardiac surgery, and they start having stridor, think about those slides that Michael had earlier, and uh, think about subglottic stenosis. But remember, when these children are on your operating theater, extension of their neck is important, that you do not superextend their neck. You probably don't have a lateral neck x-ray to check their cl clantoaxial joint. Sometimes you do. I always request one for those who I'm operating on, because you might have a subluxation. Turner syndrome, pr pretty undersold. Um, there's a lot of movement of uh, a group of uh, people with Turner syndrome who are trying to get themselves recognized. These are invariably women or girls that come into your clinic and they have a variable IQ. They are short statured and the most that we see in ENT is hearing issues with glue ear, autosclerosis and some of them will have sensory neural hearing loss. So We'll move on to the craniofacial group with the craniosynostosis, where these children have premature fusion of the cranial sutures. Some of them are non-syndromic, a lot of them would be, but you can have syndromic ones, and that's where we come in for this talk. A lot of them are autosomal dominant, and you get a number of new mutations in those who haven't got a family history. The most common of these, and these are not uncommon, for people going through the exam is understanding their facial features. So you've got a child with eyes popping out, with proptosis. You've got mid-facial hypoplasia where the maxilla is set back and uh, they, may, they have hypotellarism. Some of them will have skeletal anomalies. Um, the most important thing is that this is, this is a timely diagnosis because they undergo, with the premature uh, fusion of the cranial sutures, hydrocephalus and increased intracranial pressure. And of course, there are the ophthalmological consequences of proptosis. So this is Cruzon's. A child has got significant exophthalmus proptosis. And you can understand that this is a child who's going to be needing an ophthalmologist to care for. They have mid-facial hyperplasia, they've got mandibular prognathism, and a lot of these patients also present with different types of hearing loss. The most common reason why an ENT surgeon would see this other than hearing loss is for their airway obstruction. They've got narrow pharynxes, the pharynx itself is quite small, and you, you, you kind of look inside, okay, you know, do I do a tonsillectomy, an adenoidectomy on these patients? You take them to theater, and actually in recovery, they're not good because actually you've done, you, you've not managed to solve it. It's all in the skeletal problems of their face. And this kind of carries on with APERTs, okay? They have the same sort of thing, but they have some salient differences with cruzons where they have syndactyly, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide. Again, proptosis, and you have got to think about their airway obstruction issues. You've got Pfeiffer syndrome, again, you can see the bulging eyes, and again, they will need uh, uh, multidisciplinary input for their various issues. These have got broad thumbs and toes, and sometimes you may have radio ulnar fusion with them. They all kind of have uh, varying levels of uh, hearing loss and dental problems. So in these craniosynostosis patients, it's always important to have an MDT group that are dealing with them. I think Birmingham in the Midlands is uh, our uh, craniofacial department where we all refer those patients to them and they have a group that deals with it, which includes a pediatric ENT surgeon, a pediatrician, a neurosurgeon with uh, interest in craniofacial, uh, in craniosynostosis, and possibly a maxillofacial surgeon as well. Timely intervention is highly necessary <laughs> considering the hydrocephalus and the intracranial pressure that may increase. When you do have treatment for ENT symptoms, particularly in the presence of obstructive sleep apnea, PHD and PIC support is, uh, I can't stress much, but it is vital. 
uh, because you can take them to theater, they have this obstructive episode, you'll suddenly need CPAP. Without a PhD or PIC, you support that's absent in your trust, and that's when you have got to think about where you see these children, where you refer them on if you're in a district general hospital with others' facilities. So we come to the connective tissue uh, syndromes. Uh, mucopolysaccharidosis is rare. It's not common, but it results from a genetic form of lysosomal storage disorders. There are a number of them there. You, you know, you count them up to seven. I mean, it's impossible to kind of remember all of them in your head. The important thing to note is what it does. One, it's essentially a no, it's pre, it prevents the normal breakdown of certain uh, deposits, which then end up going into the different parts of the body cells and then cr increasing their size and uh, thickness. So most except uh, type 2 autosomal recessive, you've got a number there. But the most important thing that you have to think about is what this leads to. So deposition into the, face, into the skin leads to some coarse features. These are generally dwarf patients with skeletal irregularities. And there's a host of issues. The most important thing that you need to kind of remember is they get recurrent respiratory infections. They get recurrent acute otitis media. And they have cardiac uh, my, uh, anomalies, mainly due to the deposition of uh, the, uh, the abnormal waste products that we can't, they can't get rid of. But where do we come in? Well, the tongue starts getting bigger. There is adenotonsillar hypertrophy. The vocal cords get thick. It's all about deposition and unable to maintain our normal structures. The ones that are quite hairy when you come across is when actually the depositions around your trachea and your bronchial airway, and you suddenly see that they're actually narrowing, and you, you kind of think, oh, can you put a tracheostomy in? Sometimes the, the, the obstruction is further in and uh, into the chest. So all of this requires a pediatric ENT surgeon's input, but with the help of possibly a cardiothoracic person as well. It's, it, and they all are maintained in a, in a center which deals with MPS. So other than the simple stuff like the hearing loss that we would be dealing with and recurrent ear infections, we always have to be mindful of the other pathologies these children come with. But you don't have to go and remember every single one of them. The most common one is San Filippo. So osteogenesis imperfecta, it's self-evident, the blue sclera, broken bones. It's the hearing loss that we see often. We come to the branchial anomalies related syndromes. Got the golden haas. Most of them are sporadic actually, and some of them can be uh, autosomal, recessive or dominant. And males tend to be more common uh, than females. The issue is here that one part of the skull is asymmetrical to the other, is the development of this. And actually, with this leads to a number of issues leading to uh, coming across from the underdeveloped side of the head. So the underdeveloped side of the head will have varying degrees of underdevelopment, which will affect the, which will be as a result of the effect of the branchial arch on that side, which, as you would know, hearing can be affected, the eye due to the, uh, the way the face has formed. Some of them have feeding difficulties, and there's about 10% mental retardation to a moderate degree in these. Treacher Collins syndrome, you'd see them when you, you, you'd recognize one of these children when you see them. They're either a mutation or autosomal dominance. And the most important thing to note is it'll affect all the structures of the first and the second pharyngeal arches, grooves, and pouches. And they're all symmetrically diminished. So unlike the golden house, which is asymmetrical, it's on one side, the Trisha Collin is a combination of that. A lot of people believe when you see an abnormal looking child that this child is not going to be able to understand you properly and their mental intellect isn't quite good. But actually, these children are very with it and you've got to appreciate that and treat them according to it. Not that you have to treat the others otherwise, but you know, just be a bear of that in mind. So 
the down slanting palpebra, the hearing loss in this cleft palate is noted in this. You've got OSA, they have small mandibles as well. So it's actually, they're, they're quite a difficult intubation group. Um, a lot of these have micrognathia and uh, you, you will find a, a grade four intubation for these a lot of the times. And as Michael alluded to, the glidoscope is fantastic for these children uh, where you can actually see the airway a little bit better, but it's not that easy to intubate if they're older. Uh, and you have peanut anomalies with it and potentially microtia. So they all need a multidisciplinary input. You've got, you know, the, the eye symptoms go to the ophthalmology. They have hearing loss invariably. A lot of them will need hearing aids. Most, a good number of them potentially Baja. Um, there's cleft palate tense uh, speech and language therapy team for those children with the cleft palate issues. A pediatric airway team that will be managing their pediatric airway because a lot of them can be quite severe. And then you've got to start thinking about maxillofacial team input, where the mandibular advancement is going to help. My understanding of teacher Collins compared to the simple Pierre Robin syndrome is that in teacher Collins, the, the mandibular advancement isn't as successful as it is for the, uh, the, primary, teacher, uh, the primary PRS. And of course, you, you see if you've got a microtia clinic to send them to. This is just a slide to show you the various syndromes on uh, cleft. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but you can see them on your left and uh, take a note of those. You can uh, see that there are multiple other ENT issues associated with them that you may want to look up. Prada Willie. So what do we have? We've got a child that's been referred to you by the pediatrician. They're often in the hospital and they have come in for some reason or not. And then the pediatricians look at them at night and say, oh my goodness, they're obstructing. They've got sleep apnea. They're big children, you know. And a lot of the time is their morbid obesity because they can't stop eating. Their hypothalamic dysfunction gets them to eat constantly. The mom tells you, you know, I can hide all the food somewhere in the cupboards and I'll lock the cupboards, but my child will want it and I cannot prevent it. Um, there are things that the pediatricians do, such as providing growth hormone, but the growth hormone may make the OSA worse. Most of the time it's trying to improve the little airway that you've got and uh, you may take out tonsils. Sometimes they're very piddly, they're not huge, they're not impressive, but you're trying to see if you can make a difference. The important thing is they're morbidly obese. They will, be, they will have obstructive sleep apnea. And again, it's good to have a, multi, a multidisciplinary input for these. These are more challenging, the backward widowman syndrome, where a child is born with potentially with a risk of hypoglycemia, but they have got this big tongue and small head, um, which sometimes they might have some like uh, the abdominal defects uh, in the center. But when you look at them, uh, you kind of know that this is a potential diagnosis with their tongue sticking out at that stage. And it's all about the deposition of stuff, of uh, waste into their uh, tissues, again, uh, leading to visceromegaly. So with, with regards to this, what do we do? As you can see highlighted in it, we come in with regards to macroglossia. You can't necessarily easily treat macroglossia in every, uh, in every unit. Macroglossia requires tongue reduction in some of these, and uh, I think uh, it's best to send it to a unit that does that. There are others that are not part of a particular group, but I'll try and cover them because they are important because these are things that you will potentially get asked in the exam. So branchial autorenal syndrome, you come in to clinic, You've got a child in front of you. You've got their father or their mother, your sister. And suddenly you notice a pattern. They've all got little uh, fistulas in their neck or they've got preauricular sinuses or they've got hearing aids. Just remember that this could be part of the bronchial autorenal syndrome. And these children will have potential renal problems. So an ultrasound scan for... Uh, uh, for the kidneys with uh, use and ease to be done are very important. Get them tested for their hearing. When you see one of these fistulas that come in, 
make sure you get a hearing test because you might be missing it because some, maybe just a spontaneous mutation you might miss. PRS, I'm sure some of us will have come across this. This is where you've got micrognathia in the fetus leading to glossoptosis where the tongue falls back, comes and affects the development of the palate and uh, the upper and causing upper airway obstruction as a result of the glossoptosis and the <coughs> micrognathia. A lot of them can be isolated as well. They can be as part of a syndrome or not. And uh, if they are, they're, if they are inherited, they're autosomal dominant. How do, how do you deal with these? When these children are born, they find it, you know, you, you will find that they struggle with their breathing. There'll be a degree of stertor sound. They're uh, not necessarily saturating on air easily because they've got to work hard. The first things first, get past that micrognathia and MPA is an amazing life-saving uh, airway agent and uh, you, don't, you may not have to do anything for them, just leave an MPA in. In certain parts of the world, when I was in Australia, they don't, I, I never saw PRS and mainly because when once these patients came along, they said they were sent straight to theater for a mandibular advancement, taken to PICU, tubed for a while, and then extubated. And as a result, the mandibular advancement kind of sorted it out. These, guys, these children grow out of uh, their micro, micrognathia with time, and they get better. So in the UK, we, used to, we, we use NPAs quite regularly for them, and we have a good community network of nurses that will provide that care for them and support for the family. Charge, not uncommon. As you can see in red, you can see how uh, the components of charge form together. It is a syndrome. It has a mutation on chromosome 18, oh, on chromosome 8, sorry. Um, they have a, multi a multitude of anomalies, all of which need to be addressed with a multidisciplinary team. So when it comes to ENT, or you're sending, you want to find out that they, they've got coronal atresia because they can't stick nasogastric tubes in and they're not, you know, they're, they're, they only get better, and the sets only get better when they cry. Uh, in the neonatal unit, you go to the CT scanner, give them some vasoconstriction, clear up the secretion so that the, the life, your life is made easier from a scan that you obtain without much gunk inside the nasal passages. These children, if they're going to go to theater, will need an echo anyway. They will have, uh, they may have uh, cardiac anomalies. A renal ultrasound is uh, requested at a later stage potentially, but you will have use and ease. And make sure that all these teams that you see on your right hand side are involved in the care of these patients because invariably they will need them. And there we go. This is some Game of Thrones is coming out in April for those of you who watch it. I quite like this character. Um, He's got achondroplasia. We see them in our clinic. These are patients that do come into our clinics. They have generally a normal uh, mental intellect and uh, they have the characteristic features of dwarfism. With us in ENT, how do we see them? They come in, the pediatricians have done a sleep, uh, sleep study or parents are talking about them obstructing at night. Always make sure you have a good sleep study done, not an oximetry, you have a PSG, a level two or a level two sleep study done because they will have central apneas, not just obstructive sleep apnea. And when you sort their obstructive sleep apnea by getting their adenotonsillar hypertrophy out, they may still have a little bit of sleep apnea left, but they will still have a central component. And when you're taking the tonsils out, don't, don't stop, uh, do stop to think about the cervical instability, a bit like how trisomy 21 have it, atlantoaxial um, instability is present in there. They will have otitis media with effusion and sensory neural hearing loss. One of my colleagues uh, who was doing her fellowship at the Evelina uh, was dealing with an otitis media with effusion patient with achondroplasia, took that patient to theater, stuck her myringotomy blade in and gosh, it came out. A lot of these was later found that they actually have high jugular bulbs that can be deficient. So remember that when we're thinking about putting grommets in these patients, maybe get a scan. 
I know it's a whistle stop to a lot of syndromes. I hope I've not bored you, and I hope you've taken a few salient points. But if you're going to take anything, remember to do a multidisciplinary approach for these children. You're not alone in these. Remember the Google friend, and actually do it with the patient's parents in clinic if they're really rare. Be open to the parents. They will appreciate it a lot of the times. And if you find that you, it's beyond your uh, remit, as a, if you're not a pediatric ENT surgeon or you don't have a pediatric ENT group uh, or a bunch of specialists in your trust, send them across to the places that do and make sure that uh, they have an MDT approach. Most of the time, these patients will have either a hearing problem, a speech-related problem, or an airway problem when they come to you. Thank you. Any questions? I have one slide for you just to take away, but that's it. Thank you.